It's U of L today on 93.9 The Ville. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. So glad you're joining us for the next 30 minutes or so. We're Hopefully you'll learn a little something about the University of Louisville and the people who work there, and hopefully get you a little bit of information about some things that you can use in your daily life. So what have we got on the show today? Well, she fled war-torn Bosnia when she was just eight years old, came to the U.S., and became interested in medicine while serving as an English translator for her aging grandfather. Now she's a graduate of the UofL School of Medicine and on the road to becoming a doctor. It's an amazing story you'll want to hear, and we'll have that coming up. But first, half of Americans who reach age 85 have some form of dementia, and the cost of caring for adults with dementia and Alzheimer's in particular has skyrocketed to $269 billion. Karen Robertson is Professor Emerita in the UofL School of Nursing. She led a dementia caregiver study, and she is here to talk about it and what caregivers can do to help uh, treat folks with dementia and Alzheimer's. Well, welcome, Karen. I'm thrilled to be here. Great to have you. Great to have you. Well, tell me what the Dementia Caregiver Study is. What is that? It is a program of research that looks at evidence-based interventions that help caregivers adjust to taking care of someone with dementia. And probably early in the program, we should define the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease. That's good, because I don't know the difference. (laughs) Alzheimer's is part of dementia, right? Dementia is a broader category, right? Am I wrong or right? Dementia is the broad umbrella, Okay. and all the different diseases that cause memory loss Mm -hmm. are under that umbrella. So when you hear, when the listeners hear the word dementia, it means that brain damage has occurred, that there is a disease that's causing progressive brain damage. But dementia refers to the symptoms that occur with brain damage, particularly memory loss and confusion and agitation. Right. Most of the diseases result in the same symptoms. So the broad category is dementia. And then under that category, the most important disease that causes the most cases is Alzheimer's disease. Uh, causes as many as 70 to 80 percent of cases and the second disease people should be aware of is vascular dementia it's vascular dementia yes i have never heard of that what is that it's the heart disease that i know what vascular means but heart disease dementia (laughs) doesn't make any sense to me what what happens is that the heart um, is not strong enough or the arteries clog and so Uh, enough oxygen does not get to the brain and thus uh, brain cells die because of uh, the heart is not working properly or the arteries are clogged right so um, the audience should be aware of the difference those people that have vascular dementia are more likely to have plateaus they don't necessarily progress the same as Alzheimer's disease. So people should, that you can prevent vascular dementia. Right. People should prevent heart disease. Right. And Keep they their can heart prevent that. Yes. Right. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit that uh, you did this caregiver study. So people who are caring for a loved one that has Alzheimer's dementia, the broader category, uh, is going to want to hear something. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I want you to go over some of the statistics, which I, were really jarring when uh, you sent them to me and when I looked some up online. So why don't you go over the st- uh, okay. statistics of How many folks have Alzheimer's? How many folks have the broader uh, dementia in the United States and and the cost of those caregivers? Okay, yes. In Kentucky, 17,000 people have Alzheimer's disease. And the listeners should be aware that the main problem with our society is we have an aging society. And the biggest risk factor for these diseases, uh, dementia that we're talking about, is age. The older you are, the more at risk you are. And the more older folks we have in Kentucky, the more dementia we're going to have. Exactly. And particularly because heart disease is the number one cause of death, um, a lot of people have both dementia from Alzheimer's and from vascular Mm -hmm. dementia. So probably many people have a mixed form. But um, by the time you are 85, 49% of the population have some form of dementia. Now, that's including all of the different diseases. 
And um, so if you're 85 years old and you don't have some memory issues, you're you're good, you're good but you're one <laughs> yes. and two. I mean, yes. the, the guy next to you that's 85 years old does have some memory right. issues. Yes, that's that's a yes. that's a big number. It is. And the reason we have the aging population is baby boomers. So we need to be aware that baby boomers, uh, the cause is that when World War II ended, all the soldiers came home and began their families. So our population generally is flat until you get to the baby boomers. And every few seconds, a baby boomer is turning age 65. And that's when the risk is greatest, right. after age 65. Right. And I think so you, and it's a worldwide problem because it was a world war. So it's not just here in the U.S., it's the whole world is dealing with this. And how many folks in the United States are dying from Alzheimer's, dementia-related causes um, each year? Ballpark, do you know? It, it oh, is. It's killing a lot of people. I know that. It is. It's the sixth largest it's the sixth biggest cause of death and each year more people it's going to grow and grow it, it obviously as we get older yeah. because yeah. of the uh, baby boomers yeah and there is there any cure anything on the horizon that seems to this is the one drug one disease there is no drug there is no way at this time in science to stop or uh, prevent the disease even. And here was a surprise to me. You sent a little note along that this uh, Alzheimer's kills more people than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. Yes. Wow. Yes. That's, yes. That's a bunch of folks. We're making much more progress in all the other diseases. Mm -hmm. a and so, therefore, because uh, we don't have a way to slow it down or stop the disease, it is. It's the largest cause of what well, the sixth leading cause of death as well as the, becoming the most expensive of all diseases and that's primarily because unfortunately as a disease progresses most families cannot care for the person at home eventually most families have to look at nursing home placement and right. that's the most expensive kind of care so let's talk a little bit about that about the people who are trying to care for those loved ones um, who now have Alzheimer's, have dementia, um, what do you tell them? What are some of the recommendations that came out of this study and this survey that you did? What I found in my research is that caregivers back into this situation without any preparation. And this situation is not common sense. Therefore, caregivers need to gain new skills and new knowledge to improve their own quality of life. And when they improve their quality of life, they're also improving their loved one, the person with dementia. And so first we have to talk about the negative outcomes that result from caregiving if there's no intervention. Uh, and primarily it is because of this lack of preparation, the caregiver very slowly becomes more isolated. The f phone stops ringing. They drop out of all groups, and eventually they cannot leave their loved one. And they tend not to be aware of this, and they don't prepare for it. So they become very burdened, very isolated, and depression is the number one big problem. And, and you can understand that. Yes, how can anybody you not can understand be that. depressed? Yeah, you're dealing with mom and dad 24 hours a day. Yes. Um, that's and, tough. And no matter what you do, you cannot stop this disease. So you could be the perfect caregiver and do everything perfectly but you won't stop you cannot control the disease right so you need to gain knowledge and skills and that's what my intervention did it had two components and the first component was gain it was to help the caregiver gain an understanding of the disease process and how to manage a person with dementia and the the concept that my colleague and I worked on my colleague from the University of Iowa is Dr. Kathleen Buckwalter, and um, if people go to my faculty page, they'll see that she and I published quite a bit together. But uh, she developed this concept called the progressively lowered stress threshold that is simply understood as as the disease progresses, the person with dementia is less able to cope with any kind of stress. So the caregiver should watch for when stress is building and change the environment, get rid of the stress. And part of the intervention is teaching caregivers what causes stress. 
Well, so, like what? Give me an example of well, of, so, of something that would cause a stress in my my dad if I'm caring for him, and uh, you know he gets freaked out about what, and then he okay. turns angry and he yes. doesn't necessarily know who I am. What? What's, a, what's right. an example? Some of the most common stressors are fatigue. For example, um, fatigue is less in the morning, but it progresses higher as the day goes on. So therefore, the most complicated, difficult things should be done in the morning before the fatigue really hits. And to prevent the fatigue becoming so bad, uh, rest periods during the day are needed. Give Not them naps. Make sure they take naps. Yes, but um, do not put them in bed. They should just be sitting up in the chair, short naps, and alternate difficult activities with uh, easier activities. Okay. Uh, oh. Another thing that can cause a lot of problem is uh, overload of noise and too much stimulation. And um, often the routine had establishing a routine will help calm the person doing the same thing at the same time with the same person every day right helps okay a routine a routine yes okay. all right so that's that's one component of it what's, yes. the, what's the second component the second component is everybody that deals with this person should be on the same page of what to do and what not to do for example the whole family needs to understand what causes the stress, and they should all problem solve to get rid of it. So um, for that, often without this education and everybody in the family being on the same page, the family gives bad advice. For example, they don't understand that you have to have the same routine every day. And so they'll tell the caregiver, oh, the person needs some more stimulation. They need different people. They need to people. go outside. Exactly. Today. Yeah, okay. And not true. Not true. Dad needs no. to do the same thing every day. Yes, okay. with the same people. With the same people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And very. that helps him be more oriented so that he knows that at breakfast it's morning and so on. So where do, where do folks find information about that, though? Where do they go to, to get the information that, that you just offered? Um, where do they find it? We do have wonderful partners in the community, and certainly I need to mention, first of all, the uh, most important partner is the Alzheimer's Association. We're wonderfully uh, fortunate to have their services. They offer support groups. There are many throughout Louisville. Uh, the second kind of support that we think um, our listeners need to be aware of, of is adult daycares. This is where the person goes and participates in structured activities during the day. And then it gives the um, rest of the family a uh, break during the day, but the person goes home at night. So every listener should be aware of their nearest support group and also the nearest adult daycare. Right. But otherwise, um, we need to realize that it's not just me as a researcher that's doing intervention research. We have much evidence from many researchers across the world that interventions work, and these are tested interventions. They um, improve the quality of life. We have uh, randomly controlled studies that show we can do these interventions decrease isolation, they decrease depression, and they improve the uh, quality of life for the person with dementia as well as the caregiver. It helps both members of that dyad. All right, Karen Robinson, uh, so how can people contact you if they want some more information? Yes. Anybody interested in learning more about the interventions um, can help me, actually, by uh, participating in a needs assessment. On uh, how We're trying to now to translate these interventions into services. So contact me. It's, my email is karen.robinson at louisville.edu. That's and an I'll, easy one, karen.robinson at louisville.edu. I'll spell it. For well, you don't even have to spell it. <laughs> okay. I think everybody knows how to spell Karen and Robinson. Okay. So a traditional spelling of both. Traditional, so. yes. So, all right. Well, good luck with uh, your more studies, and uh, and congratulations on what you've done some f so far, because this is just a, a, a burgeoning field uh, as we're trying to find, a, a, a cure for Alzheimer's, and, B, some help for those who are caring for folks with Alzheimer's. So good luck. Right. Malia Rostanovich K. Deach has an amazing story to tell. She recently graduated from the U of L School of Medicine, but it's how she got to this point and how
and how U of L and her family supported her. That's the amazing part. Well, welcome, Malia. First off, thank you for having me. Congratulations on your uh, degree from the U of L School of Medicine. Thank you so much. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? What kind of doctor you want to be, or do you know yet? <laughs> so um, I'm starting my residency in internal medicine at U of L um, in July, and I wanted to be a hospitalist for the longest time. A hospitalist. But um, okay. now I'm thinking maybe uh, specializing in allergy and immunology after okay. that. Okay. But we'll see. Huh. What's a hospitalist? What's that? I don't even know what that is. Never heard that term. Um, it. It's basically a doctor that will admit physician or admit patients that come in through the emergency room and take okay. care of them while they're in the hospital instead gotcha. of the outpatient setting. Gotcha. Okay. Well, the reason I stumbled across your story, uh, uh, someone did a nice story about you on U of L Today website, U of L News website, mm-hmm. and I thought it was a very inspiring story. So why don't you talk a little bit about how you got to America, sure. where you're from, how you got to America, how your family got here? Sure. Um, so I was originally born in Bosnia and. Um, 1992 is when the civil war in Bosnia started. Um, in 1995, we actually fled to Germany as refugees. Um, we stayed there for a few years, but then um, the situation became kind of either go back to uh, your home country, the wars kind of settled down, or find another place to go. So we applied to come to the United States, and at age eight, we um, settled in Bowling Green. Mm-hmm. So. so you wound up in Bowling Green, we Kentucky. Did, How in did. the world did you get from <laughs> Bosnia to Bowling Green? You haven't been the first person to ask me that. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, I honestly don't even know. I think uh, they it just depended on where you had sponsorships for refugees at that time, and they just kind of sprinkled refugees wherever they could at that point, and we ended up in Bowling Green. So. And was life in Bowling Green okay? It, it was a shock right first. We came from Berlin, Germany, so it, it was a little bit different. A much Might have been a smaller scale. city, yeah. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Uh, but honestly, we've made it home ever since, and we've loved it. And your parents still live there, right? They do. They do. All of my family actually lives over there. Just okay. my husband and I that live in Louisville. Okay. And she, so you moved to the, back to the big city of I Louisville. Did, yeah, I did. The gigantic <laughs> city. Not quite like Berlin either. <laughs> All right. So then... Um, so you're in Bowling Green, yes. um, going to public schools, I assume, in Bowling Green? Uh, or where'd you, where'd you go to school in Bowling Green? I did. Um, I did all of my schooling in Bowling Green. I started third grade down there, actually, um, as an ESL student. Um, and then I eventually ended up uh, going to Western Kentucky University for uh, undergrad. And your English is absolutely flawless. So <laughs> how did that happen? That you, I don't know. I wish I could you, tell you. Because <laughs> from the time you're eight years old, you were speaking mm-hmm. what? Bosnian. Is, is it Bosnian? And is that German a language? while I was in Germany. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Um, I think it just became a matter of you better learn this language so you can translate for your family <laughs> or they're going to struggle without you. And I, I was so excited to start school that I, I just I knew I had to complete it. They actually gave us a little white dictionary when we came here and had some most common translations on it. And uh, I just kind of took that and went to ESL classes and kind of got to master it, I guess. And you made it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're talking with Malia Rustanovich Kadich, uh, who I just said has got an amazing <laughs> story to tell that she that she got to the University of Louisville. So you went to Western Kentucky University, did, got out of high school. Did you graduate as like valedictorian or some uh, overwhelming honors? Uh, no, I think I was eighth in my class, but well, that's you know, good. that's not bad. Which which high school did you go to? In Warren Central High Warren School. Warren Central. That's a big high school. It is. It is. So eighth in your class. That's really good. So you did well in high school. And you go to Western. I did. Did you know that you wanted to be a doctor by the time you got to Western? So a part of me did. And a part of me just wanted to continue the family business that we had because it, it wasn't a hard job. What, what was I, the I family enjoyed business? It. Uh, we had a trucking company. Um, my parents started it when I was around 14 or 15 years old, and I've helped them manage it ever since. Um, but I think... Once I started taking those classes, my heart just wasn't there. Um, And then I thought back to the times that I spent in the hospital and emergency room with my grandfather while he uh, immigrated to the United States as well. Um, And then I realized that I think I should try going for pre-med. So I took a few biology and chemistry classes. And after that, it was all history because I ended up graduating um, with a biology major and chemistry minor. Okay, so you graduate from Western Mm -hmm. and then... You decide you want to go to medical school. Mm-hmm. So how'd you pick U of L? At first, I honestly applied to just kind of the geographic region around Kentucky. Wanted to stay close to home, um, but I ended up withdrawing a few of my applications and just wanted to apply to U of L, UK, Vandy, places mm-hmm. around here, much right. closer. Um, after I got my uh, 
interview invite to U of L and actually finished the interview. I think it was November or so. November of what year was that? Uh, I'm trying to think. Has that been three years ago, I guess? 12, 2012. Okay, so five years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just, I actually didn't even want to go to any more interviews <laughs> after that. The atmosphere was so welcoming. Everyone was great. It seemed like everyone was just trying to help each other succeed here. And I just, I felt right at home. So I ended up going to more interviews after that just to make sure I didn't risk it like that. But um, it was it was a good decision on my end. So I'm glad I made it. All right. We're talking with Malia Rustanovic Kadic. Did I say that right? You did. You did. Okay. Kadic. <laughs> um, a Bosnian immigrant mm -hmm. uh, from years ago. Came over here when you were eight at the mm -hmm. time. Okay. I was eight years uh, old. To the United States. And now uh, she just graduated from the University of Louisville Medical School and wants to be a doctor. Got Still got some <laughs> things to do before you get there. Um, so you've, you've had... What, five years now at the University of Louisville. What did you find? You said you found a bunch of welcoming folks at mm -hmm. the University of Louisville. But what else did you find? What was your experience here at U of L in the medical school? I feel like there was a place for everyone here. Um, it was a very inclusive environment. Um, I feel like no matter what kind of support services you needed, no matter what happened in your life, someone from the staff and faculty or even the students would be there for you. Um, I know that they've always helped with academic advising, career planning, financial aid, uh, just there's wellness initiatives going on right now. They're just absolutely amazing. Um, the LGBT Center, diversity office. I mean, I can go on for days, I feel like. It's just you never felt like you were alone at UL. Mm -hmm. And you decided, you just said earlier, that you wanted to get into allergy. Mm -hmm. uh, was there some course or some uh, doctor or teacher or someone that, you had a class with that steered you in that direction you thought that'd be really cool or was it a, some practicum or something you did what what happened so um throughout my experience in medical school uh before i got my doctorate i just felt like i liked every bit of internal medicine i like the pulmonology i like the cardiology i like the allergy but then um, my last rotation actually was an allergy rotation and i don't know something just hit me and I was like I really like this um the people I worked with were great um I worked with mainly with Dr. Jones at Kentucky and Allergy um so he kind of mentored me a little there um it was a short rotation but those two three weeks I was there were definitely worth it and I just feel like as an allergist I think um I could provide a lot of services to the people in Kentucky because I feel like here everyone has allergies yeah I was just so, gonna say the thing yeah. I was I <laughs> swear to god you took the it took the words right out of my mouth I was gonna say everybody's got allergies in Kentucky do, surely you do. can find a job uh, exactly get out um so your family is in the trucking business mm -hmm. they are so how did they help you through this process uh how, how, how'd you see that I mean I can't tell you how they've been there for me and not just financially because obviously you know when you're in medical school you're not allowed to work so you do get a lot of debt um just even emotionally some days you know you don't think you can do it anymore and it's getting too stressful and they're there to push you along so you can finish that next test or whatever it is you're doing um my husband also has been there it it really does take a special kind of person to deal with someone in medical school <laughs> and you know all their stresses and not not being home all the time and working long hours but they've, they've just all been very supportive uh they've pushed me when i didn't want to push myself and they really made me um who i am today so are you the first in your family to graduate from college i am actually i figured I as much <laughs> so and do you have any younger siblings i do uh both are of them going are to in college, college. Mm -hmm. okay i have a younger brother and a younger sister they're both at western kentucky university as so well. you've paved the way i, I tried <laughs> so how does that feel um it it feels great um i i don't want them to think that they're living in my shadows or anything like that but um i th i want to feel like i open at least some doors for them and encourage them to make something out of themselves either one of them thinking about medicine uh no my sister wants to do psychology and counseling so it's uh, similar, similar. Yeah. um and my brother's more into exercise science and business so he's he's on a different spectrum but you know we're all just trying to make something of ourselves so. right what do you tell folks um when they ask you um you know like i did why U of L? If there's a there's a potential student out there that can't decide where they want to go to, to school, what do you tell them? Um, I honestly think that you cannot get a better combination of teaching and mentorship, um, a university that's going to get you out there serving your community, but also if you're interested in research, research experience, and just 
clinical experience, you, you just get it all at U of L. You really do. And you came over here at a young age from another country, mm-hmm. and you were eight. Do you consider yourself an international student or a, a refugee, or do you no. consider? Yeah, I didn't think no. you probably did because that's been um, some time. It, it's funny because when we do uh, go to Europe to visit our home country, we say we miss Bowling Green or Louisville, and <laughs> everyone's like, "Aren't you home?" I'm like, "Not really." <laughs> I mean, I've spent almost 20 years of my life here, so I, I definitely consider myself right. more of an American. But I feel like that part of my history is always going to be with me, and it's what made me who I am today. Right. One thing I got to ask you about because I did a story on it and I know a little bit about it. Mm-hmm. The simulation lab. Yes. Have you been in there? I have. I Why have. don't you describe to people what the sim sim lab is and what it does in terms of training you to become a real doctor? Um, my most recent experience there was actually um, advanced cardiac life support, and you know it's it's something that you really need to be able to do as a doctor, but it's hard to practice saving lives on people that, you know, are dying. So in order to make sure that you are competent in that, um, using the mannequins and uh, the computers that they have with the different uh, scenarios, and there's always a teacher that helps you out with them, ultrasound machines, I mean, you name it, they have it. And it really does help prepare you when you get into the room, someone is crashing or you need to do an ultrasound, you're already prepared and you know, right. you know how to do it. And these are basically robots that are like, basically. well, six figure robots that <laughs> um, that they use to train these students and, and they can actually talk back to the students mm-hmm. and as you're describing and you can yep. do surgeries on them and those kind of, it's, it, it's really amazing. It's kind of freaky actually, it, to be honest it with It was you. at first, but you do get used to it. Um, it, it just really makes you feel like you're in that patient setting and it, it just really does prepare you to what to expect when you are. Well, you're not quite done yet, but are you about ready to go out and uh, become a real doctor? <laughs> well, um, we got our MDs on, on the 13th, but we haven't officially started until July 1st for most of us. So I, I'm excited. Anxious, but excited. Anxious, but excited. Do you, <laughs> do you plan to practice here in Kentucky? Stay in Kentucky? Um, I do. I do. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I'll stick to the big city and stay in Louisville or if I'd go back to Bowling Green, but this area, definitely. Okay. All right. Well, congratulations, first of all, on, on graduating. Good luck you. with your inter- – well, not internships. What do we, you know, residency, residency, but yeah, we are just, interns the first year. <laughs> same thing, internships, residencies, whatever you call it. So – <clears throat> Malia Rostanovich Kadich, good luck Thank in the you future. So much. All right, I sit still for it. just a second. I want to throw a little tidbit at you. I always try and do a little bit of trivia at the end of these okay. shows. So here's the Did You Know segment for today. Did you know the U of L is one of four Kentucky schools and the only public university ranked among the best college values by Kiplingers? Among public colleges, the University of Louisville is ranked 76th in the U.S. In the U.S., Kiplingers rank schools based on its definition of value, which is a quality education at an affordable price. So, see, you went to a school that uh, got you a good value for your money. (laughs) So, there you go. That's the Did You Know segment for today. All right. Uh, You can hear U of L today with Mark Hebert every Monday and now Wednesday night at 6 on 93.9 The Ville. You can also watch the programs on Metro TV, Louisville's Government Access Channel, and KET3 during the week. I'll see you on Monday mornings at 9.30 on WHAS-TV's Great Day Live with a new story about research, students, or something cool that's happening at the University of Louisville. Thanks for listening to UML Today with Mark Hebert and Go Cards.